But man, Mars is a hell of a goal. It is a Manhattan project. And that's going to look pretty awesome when you yeah. see a robot walking around on Mars. There's two problems that we're going to have um, in order to make that dream a reality. Plenty of astronauts freak out in space. They've tried to kill their whole crew before. When you're in low Earth orbit, you look out your window, you see big Earth. When you're on the moon, it's still the blue, the blue marble. When you're on Mars, it's a blue speck in the sky. What is it going to take to get there? Yeah, well, I would say first, like... <clears throat> They, they're very good at setting uh, very challenging goals at SpaceX, um, but when they achieve them, the capability has utility beyond that. So, um, you know, they need, you know, they want laser link communications between spaceships, but, you know, that also creates a giant mesh network across, across their constellation of Starlinks, which allows them to sell more consumer broadband and solve airplane and ship and vehicle uh, internet connectivity, not to mention people living in, you know, sparsely populated areas, which contributes revenue, which further funds space development. So my point is like they kill a lot of birds, one stone. So yes, there, there is certainly an organizational objective of making life multiplanetary and our best, our best first stop on that journey is Mars. But when you have a fully reusable vehicle that tops off and refills propellant in low earth orbit, you can send it anywhere. You can send it to the moon if you want. You can send it past Mars. It doesn't necessarily even have to have people on it. You could use it to send cargo for point-to-point -point DOD applications. Um, you could put giant telescopes in them and send them to every corner of our solar system and, and have them be like these prefab uh, you know, discovery probes because you basically have factories building these prefab spaceships. So um, the point is, even though it's like kind of a Mars focus, what they will get from this breakthrough of fully and rapid reusable vehicles has like broad utility. Um, but man, Mars is a hell of a goal. It is a Manhattan project. And there is a lot of things they're going to have to get right. And a lot of things the government is going to have to do. It can't all be on SpaceX's shoulders. And for that matter, all those other entrepreneurs you were talking about, they're all trying to contribute to that effort. Lots of problems that need to be solved in order to make that dream a reality. I mean, what, what year are we looking at here? Is there a time frame? I, I mean, I, I would say that within, um, within 10 years, we'll, 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 we'll have astronauts on Mars. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to ever like, you know, be out of sync with some of Elon's timetables, but I think he's even recalibrated to, you know, probably 2030s are a lot more realistic than, but we're going to see some cool stuff along the way. Like, do I think in, in 2026, he's going to, send some starships with some Optimus robots on them and maybe some will crash into Mars, maybe some will land, totally. And that's going to look pretty awesome when you yeah. see a robot walking around on Mars, even if it happens in 28. So it's not like um, we'll be without some entertainment uh, over the next, you know, 10 years until this happens. I mean, what are some of the biz biggest obstacles? I mean, we've got power and or fuel. We've got food. We've got oxygen. I mean, you just brought up all the debris that's going. I didn't. I've never even thought of that. Yeah. I mean, are there going to be refueling points? Are we going to stop on the moon? I mean, what what are the what are the the big problems that we need to solve before we he does that move? I think there's two there's two problems that we're going to have um, in order to make that dream a reality. It, th there's a lot of them. I mean, look, they're going to the reentry of of Starship onto the Mars atmosphere, propulsive landing, all that. But let's just assume they solve all those things. How do you come home? So that's the biggest issue I, I think of is like, you will be able to get astronauts there a lot sooner than you would be able to bring them home safely. And there's no one-way missions in this work. Like if someone wants to sign up for a one-way mission to Mars, auto excluded from the list, see ya. Like you were absolutely the wrong mindset to go on, a, on an endeavor like that. So you have to have pretty high confidence that you can get people back. Right now, if SpaceX were to do this entirely on their own, they're going to need to mine propellant, um, manufacture propellant on the surface of Mars. And they need a lot of power to do that. Uh, so you need either a, uh, a nuclear reactor on, uh, on a starship to create surface power, or you're going to need like endless football fields of solar cells, which I, I don't love that idea. Because I don't know what, I mean, you're going to have a million Optimus robots maintaining it and cleaning off all the dust and everything. Not to mention, the farther you are away from the sun, the less utility there is in solar power. So I think it's going to be nuclear. And you're going to need to make propellant to uh, top off your Starship to launch back home. And if you see Starships launch here on Earth, 
They have this whole stage zero, which is the whole tower with, you know, a thousand people working on it under an atmosphere in 1G, and it still doesn't go always great. So, you know, pulling off that operation to refuel and come home is going to be hard. I think the government can help with that by kind of working on what no one else is capable or willing to do that's hard, the near impossible, which is start building nuclear electric propulsion, nuclear spaceships. Um, I think it's absolutely the, the right mini Manhattan project for NASA. Get America underway under nuclear power in space. If you can do that, you take a lot of pressure off of the in-situ resource manufacturing. And then number two is going to be the human. People are going to have a hard time. Um, so nobody likes talking about this because it takes away the hero image of the astronaut. But you've had uh, plenty of astronauts freak out in space. Um, they've tried to kill their whole crew before. Like um, there is a, there was a lock put on the space shuttle door uh, for that reason. Because somebody tried to open the hatch more than once and take everybody out. There's a lock on the Dragon space capsule for that reason. Uh, that was a carryover from that time period. Um, it's happened to co uh, to Russian cosmonauts. It's happened to American astronauts. And and this is during a time when most of the American astronauts were the best of the best coming out of the the military. So um, it is a unique environment and that stressor has caused people to to crack. So that's the psychology of it. Now, when you're in low earth orbit, you can be in the water in 90 minutes. So you're 90 minutes from being on a helicopter ride to a cheeseburger and people have cracked in space. Uh, when you're on the moon, you're two and a half days from coming home. Um, and, uh, and when you're on Mars, uh, you could be anywhere from six to nine months to more than, well over a year before you can come home. So, and that's, and, and like, and think about it from like, a, again, from, you get into the, like the psychology of it. When you're in low earth orbit, you look out your window, you see big earth. When you're on the moon, it's still the blue, the blue marble. When you're on Mars, it's a blue speck in the sky. So like, um, we're, we're going to have the, a, you know, psychological issues to deal with when you send uh, humans to that environment. And then you're going to have physiological issues, which is we didn't evolve to be in sub 1G. So astronauts spend six to nine months on the space station. They come back to Earth. They're a wreck for two weeks. Right? So basically, that's the equivalent time of going to Mars. So when they get to, you know, um, you know, a reduced gravity environment and they step off the spaceship, are they going to throw up in their helmet? <laughs> what if we have to do surgery? Nobody's done surgery in space. I mean, it's only a matter of time when you're on multi-year missions that someone's going to have a ruptured appendix maybe or, or something else that goes on. So like all the things that make us who we are um, are going to be highly problematic on journeys of two years plus um, in space. And we got to figure that out. Um, you know, at some point, if that doesn't mean you have to have it for the first four people. But if you're talking about sending thousands of people uh, into space. There's a lot where, you know, into, uh, onto an outpost on Mars. There's a lot from the psychology and physiological side of being, of, of being a human being that we have to figure out. Man, it's just something I can't even fathom. I mean, sending thousands of people to another planet when we haven't, we haven't even sent anybody back to the moon. And what, how long has it been? 60 something years? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, and I mean, what is the 53 years? What do you think the plan is? I mean, what, when we okay, we got a thousand volunteers. We're going to we're going to Mars. I mean, what does that look like? Well, first, I mean, again, I, I think you got to have some of the most highly screened individuals possible, mm -hmm. and because um, we haven't learned anything about this yet. Like, I, I, I'm the analog astronaut environments where they put people in like shipping containers and these bubbles. Like, look, you do learn some things from it, but you open the door, you're on Earth. You know, if somebody's having a heart attack, you open the door, like they're going to, you know, it's, um, you always know in your mind that, un, you know, underneath you is, is your home planet. Um, so, I, you know, it's just a, um, it, it's, it's going to be that psychological stressor, not to mention all the physiological issues. You're going to have to pick some highly screened individuals that are capable of going on that mission. You have to know for sure, like that you have a way to bring them home. Um, there are no one-way missions on those first ones. You get that right, and then you can start building up that outpost. Um, look, in terms of the technical skills to go, whether it's the moon, uh, the moon or Mars, the, like the, the, the incremental velocity, whether you're going to the moon or Mars, is negligible. So if you can build a spaceship and top it off in low Earth orbit with tons of propellant, you can send it to the moon or Mars. The only difference now at this point is habitability, um, landing, and how you come home. And Starship 
should should be both for you know should be able to work fine for both considering both are designed for habitability landing um but coming back from the moon is a hell of a lot easier than coming back from mars i mean have you thought about that have you thought about what civilization looks like on mars it's gonna be horrible let's say it's you know let's say <laughs> i mean if 2030 ish seems to be the goal what does it look like in 2050 2060 not much better I mean, it's going to be horrible for a while. That's why, like, there's a, um, like, we're probably, there's a spectrum here of um, making life multiplanetary. Elon has correctly identified the probably the most important goal for Mars is to make it self sustaining. So if someday something terrible were to happen on Earth and the resupply ships stopped coming, that, that you know, our species could continue on. Totally. Um, you know, from my perspective, like, Mars doesn't have to become earth never will become anything like earth not in any foreseeable future it is more of an outpost in my mind it is more akin to a research station in antarctica than anything else like we need to get there and show that we can get there and that we can you know maintain an outpost and you know generate power and propellant and learn things with the idea that we are going to continue on that it is one stop on a much longer, grander journey, because that is not going to be a good home. Um, and we also have been fa never faced anything like this in, in, in our history here on Earth. You know, the age of exploration, you get on a ship, you go from, from Europe to the New World. Trees are trees, water is water, fish are fish, deer are deer. Um, you work really hard, you chop down enough trees, you build a bigger house. Um, you know, you, you, you figure out, you know, you're trapping fur and you're selling enough of it, like you, you're wealthy or whatnot. You could spend your entire life on Mars. You're going to be in a bubble. Like you're not going to go outside and, you know, chop down more trees and build a nicer bubble. So life there is not going to be pretty. Um, but it, we have to go there and we have to have that stepping stone if we want to go even farther. And we must, because even Mars is, you know, again, it's our next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. it, it's nothing compared to the trillions of galaxies out there that we are inevitably destined to explore. How do you think NASA, I mean, you had mentioned earlier that SpaceX shouldn't be the one to have to head all of this up. Where does, where does someone like NASA fall into play? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic, fantastic question because of late, you know, there's been this, this kind of like, um, do we even need NASA anymore? Of course we need NASA. Like NASA, a government agency, why are we all chipping in as taxpayers into an agency like NASA? because you need NASA to do what no one else is capable of doing. Like um, what no organization, nonprofit or company is capable of doing. Um, and that's what they did for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And parts of it today, they still do. Like the whole science, uh, planetary sciences side, heliophysics, like they're, they're doing things that no one else will do unless we as taxpayers fund it. And we should, because we should wanna know um, about the solar system around us. We're highly dependent on our star. Um, we should know as much as we can about that. Star can get angry at times, create solar storms. It's problematic for our way of life on here. We should study these things. But then there's another side of NASA, and it's about 40% of the budget, that does a lot of things that SpaceX and companies eventually like Blue Origin and Rocket Labs and Stoke will be capable of doing. And that's a problem. It's a problem when NASA's in the business of building rockets, and so is Blue Origin, and so is SpaceX. Because if you're doing what other people are doing, you know, what's the draw? Why wouldn't you just go work at SpaceX and you get, get a bunch of stock that's gonna be worth money or go work at Blue Origin and get a bunch of stock that's gonna be worth even more? NASA needs to constantly be recalibrating to do the near impossible, what no one else is doing, and the things they figured out, they hand off to industry. Industry is gonna build rapidly reusable rockets that'll reduce the cost of space materially. Awesome. I hope SpaceX and Blue Origin Rocket Lab are competing like crazy because they're gonna make their rockets awesome and lower cost. What should NASA be doing? What they can't. Build nuclear spaceships. Like no one, these companies are not gonna play around with highly enriched uranium. They're not gonna, they're never gonna take the liability nor get the approvals to launch, uh, you know, nuclear reactors with, with highly enriched uranium in it. Um, that's exactly what taxpayers should be funding NASA to do. And in doing so, it will help enable commercial industry do what they want to do. Um, so that's kind of the, you know, the division of responsibilities, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, you know, is, what do you think the most important part of uh, the journey to Mars is? Is it, is it exploration? Is it, is it a fallout shelter of Earth cease to exist? I mean, what, 
what do you, in your mind, you know, what is the most important part or, or, or all of the parts of why we should be going there? Well, there's an, there's an optimist side in and a pessimist side. The optimist side is like, who knows what we may find? Mm-hmm. What if we find that there was life there at some point in time or another? That'd be quite the development, wouldn't it? Um, and actually, it's, it's very helpful for funding all things space-related because in my mind, there's only two ways you have the future that, that we all dream of someday, one of which is an orbital economy that helps pay for it all, or two, find proof that we're not alone. Because if you do, the demand for that knowledge will be insatiable, and it mm-hmm. will fund lots of you know, exploration and, and discovery missions. So they, there's, there's a possibility we might find proof of life. Um, the capabilities we will develop in order to get to Mars will become a, a national asset. We could use it for transporting telescopes, for mining asteroids, for going to and from the moon and helium-3. Like All these capabilities, like I mentioned before, that that will need to be pioneered in order to make that mission possible will be useful. You build nuclear spaceships, you could have nu- you could have solid state lasers in space, you could have a whole new golden dome apparatus as a result of it. So there's lots of like good or useful things that can come from uh, you know establishing an endeavor like that. The kind of you know uh, more negative approach to it or hedge, if you will, is what if something really awful happens here on Earth? Mm-hmm. You know there aren't any dinosaurs around anymore. Um, so you pick it. I mean, eventually at some point or another, our star will kill us off. Um, or maybe it's a bioweapon or a chemical weapon or a nuclear war or, uh, some new virus that just appears out of nowhere and takes us out. I mean, uh, we're an asteroid. <clears throat> that's just a, that's just a matter of time. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, Share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.